Good evening, wonderful viewer. I am the Marine Painter, and tonight we are going to talk about this painting and the Battle of the Sound of 1658, which does not refer to a 17th century musical competition, but instead to a naval battle between the Dutch and Swedish navies that took place in this bit of water called the Sound. But before we begin painting, we first need to understand why the Dutch and the Swedes were so angry with each other in the first place. It all began with the ascension of the Swedish King Charles X, who upon gaining the throne in 1655 went to war with virtually all of his neighbours as he wanted to conquer the entire Baltic coastline. By 1658 his eye had fallen on the Kingdom of Denmark, which was quickly overrun with only the capital of Copenhagen holding out. However, as it was cut off and under siege from all sides, it would only be a matter of time before it too would fall. For the Dutch, the imperial ambitions of the Swedish king posed a bit of a problem. Because while the famous Dutch trade with the East Indies made them very wealthy, the trade with the Baltic Sea actually kept them alive. The Dutch Republic was a tiny urbanized state that produced neither the food to feed itself, nor the wood to build ships, or even the iron to arm them. Everything that sustained the Republic was imported from the Baltic, where wood, iron and grain were produced aplenty. For this reason, the Dutch had long maintained good-ish relationship with the Danes, since they controlled the Sound, the only waterway into the Baltic. But after Swedes would manage to take Copenhagen, the entry into the Baltic would be controlled by a rival great power, rather than the slightly more amenable Danes. This could not be allowed to happen, and so in October 1658 the Dutch sent a fleet to relieve the siege of Copenhagen. The fleet would arrive in the Sound on the 28th of October. They anchored for the night just north of the castle of Kronborg which was built by the Danes to control the strait, but was currently occupied by the Swedes. The next morning, the Dutch fleet, propelled by a strong northwestern wind, sailed through the Sound, where the Swedish fleet was waiting for them. To avoid being shelled from Kronborg, the Dutch had to sail closer to the Swedish coastline, where there were fewer fortifications. And at 8 o'clock in the morning, the Swedish King Charles himself opened the battle with an ineffectual artillery barrage from the battlements of Kronborg. And this is the moment I wanted to portray in this painting, as it seemed pretty iconic to me. As I was figuring out how to best portray this moment, there were three elements I definitely wanted to include. Firstly, of course, the castle of Kronborg firing the first shots. Secondly, the Dutch flagship, the Eindracht. And finally, a small Goyot, used by Willem van der Velde the Elder, this wonderfully cheerful chap, who was hired by the Dutch Navy to immortalize the battle. And so I ended up with a view of the castle visible between the ships of the Dutch advance. And with this oil study finished, it was time to move on to the real deal. For this painting, I used a larger panel of 50 by 40 centimeters in order to adequately show all the little details that delight me so much about this story. And with our acrylic layer applied, we can start with the oil painting. For the sky, I used a collage of photographs which I took over several days in order to get the right lighting. I also wanted the seas to be a bit rough. No storms or anything, but I did want to make the wind seem quite strong, because the direction of the wind actually gave the Dutch fleet a significant advantage during the battle. So it is an important part of the story. Now it is time to paint the main attraction, the Eindracht, which is Dutch for unity. My source for this painting is this drawing of the Eindracht, which was actually made by Willem van der Velde the Elder a day after the battle. 
The ship was commanded by Jacob van Opdam, an old admiral who was crippled by gout and led the second squadron of the Dutch fleet from a chair on the poop deck of the Eindracht. The reason I chose this ship, rather than the vanguard of the Dutch advance, was because I wanted to create a sense of foreboding. The strong wind means that there is no turning back for the crew of the Eindracht, who can already see the enemy and hear the distant rumble of cannon fire. Their fate is now tied to a big wooden machine in which they are nothing but a cog. These musings about the scary nature of naval warfare aside, as we are moving up the stern of the ship, I have to talk about another, possibly even more important reason why I chose this ship. It is really beautiful, and I will use any excuse, however flimsy, to allow myself to paint such detailed wood carving. Finally, with 72 guns, the Eindracht was also the biggest ship in the Dutch fleet. She was built in response to the crushing defeats of the First Anglo-Dutch War, in which the much more heavily armed ships of the Royal Navy wiped the seabed with the small warships of the Dutch. Painting her was therefore also a wonderful learning experience, as I had never painted a ship that big in such detail before. With the hull of the Eindracht finished, it is time to set the stage of the battle, beginning with the castle of Kronborg. It dominates many paintings of the battle, like the one you see here, but I wanted it to be a bit more realistic, as the Dutch fleet was actually quite far away from the castle. Finally, I had all the puffy white clouds of the ineffectual artillery barrage that is being unleashed by King Charles. The composition also demanded a detailed ship in front of the Eindracht, and for that role I chose the Zon. Partly because she was also a part of the second squadron, which was led by the Eindracht, but to be honest, I really wanted to paint the wonderful sun at the stern of the ship, as I do sometimes get a bit tired of all the heraldry that usually adorns the sterns of Dutch ships. And with the hulls of the big ships finished, it is time to move on to the boat of Willem van der Velde the Elder, who I absolutely had to include in this painting because he and his son, Willem van der Velde the Younger, are by far my favorite maritime painters of the 17th century. The design for this boat, called the Goyot in Dutch, was taken from a painting by van der Velde of another battle where he painted himself in his boat right there. Now what makes the Van der Velde so amazing is that until the advent of photography, the only live images of naval warfare that I am aware of were the drawings of the Van der Velders, who were present for many naval battles during the 17th century. And their drawings also tell us a lot about Dutch tactics during this period. Dutch ships were usually smaller and carried fewer heavy guns than their counterparts, so they had to rely on the ferocity of their boarding actions to carry the day. This usually resulted in complete pandemonium, especially during the Battle of the Sound, as the Swedes also preferred this tactic. But it could not be further from the orderly lines of battle that characterized naval warfare in later centuries, like in this painting of the Battle of Chesapeake, in 1781. The sails provided another way in which I could distinguish this painting. Since the Dutch chose not to mount top gallons, this top part, on their masts, they feared that the autumn storms in the North Sea would tear them off, and I really like incorporating these kinds of unique details in order to distinguish this scene from paintings of any other battles fought during this period. Finally, it's time for the cruise of the ships. I wanted the Eindracht to seem bustling with activity, with crews scurrying about and distributing weapons and ammunition in preparation for the coming battle.
but much more importantly, on Van der Velde's Goyote, I also wanted to paint the man himself. In this case, I dressed him in a flamboyant red cloak, which may be a bit much, but who cares. Next to him, I also put a figure holding a very long roll of paper, since that is how he worked during these battles. He drew very large panoramas on these rolls of paper, in which he mainly indicated the positioning of sails and the position of specific ships. When he was back in his studio, he could always use his collection of ship portraits to turn these sketches into fully detailed paintings. Van der Velde's paintings also proved invaluable for painting the flags. Right on the edge of this one, we can for instance see the zon, in the thick of battle. And in the middle of this one we can clearly see the Eindracht, though the flag on the stern of the ship was apparently knocked over during the battle. So for this flag I defer to this painting I showed earlier. Here we see the Eindracht flying the blood flag, which I thought would be a really nice fit for this painting. Firstly because the painting really needed some more red, but also because this flag was only hoisted when there was to be no mercy. So it really fit with the story about the ferocity that inevitably accompanied the Dutch emphasis on boarding enemy ships. And with that, this painting is finally finished. So let's now have a look back at how the painting evolved. From a pencil sketch, to an oil sketch, to the final finished product. In the end, the Dutch would win the Battle of the Sound, with the Swedes losing five ships and the Dutch won, though almost all ships had been damaged during the battle and thousands of men had been killed and wounded. The Dutch then sailed on to Copenhagen, where they helped the Danes repel a final assault on the city by the Swedish king. The Eindracht would continue to serve as Obdam's flagship, until 1665, when she met a grisly end. During the first battle of the Second Anglo-Dutch War, she once again charged the enemy in order to board the English ships. However, she did not stand a chance against the organized English line of battle, and as she engaged the Royal Charles, she suddenly and violently exploded and sank with only five survivors. Finally, I would like to thank everyone who has made it all the way to the end. Though this episode ended on a bit of a downer, in the next painting we will explore one of the funnier episodes of 17th century naval history. Goodbye for now, and I hope to see you all again soon with the next one.